Lunch, welcome back. My name is Mike Wilson. I'm an environmental health scientist at the School of Public Health and the Associate Director for Integrative Sciences at the Berkeley Center for Green Chemistry. The next uh, several sessions this afternoon are probably best characterized in the old story of the three engineers whose car broke down uh, on their way to the Green Chemistry Conference. They were sitting on the side of the freeway and the mechanical engineer said, well, it's got to be something to do with the drive chain, or the drivetrain. It's got to be something to do with the engine. The chemical engineer said, no, 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 it's a fuel mixture problem. There's not enough oxygen in the fuel. And the, the computer engineer said, all right, let's just all get out of the car, get back in, and slam the doors. <laughs> and so, the point being that uh, we're in an interdisciplinary environment, and everyone is attempting to understand their, excuse me, their various uh, expert areas of expertise and their various cultures. So we're we're going to draw the resolution back uh, on green chemistry as a science of innovation, to include the environmental health sciences uh, that inform that science, and the economic policy and legal drivers that play such a critical role in influencing uh, investment decision making uh, in companies. And these sessions are about advancing both the science of green chemistry and its broad adoption uh, by society. So to begin, uh, it is my great honor to introduce Senator Joe Simidian. Senator uh, Simidian represents California's 11th Senate District, which extends from the Mid-Peninsula region in the north to Santa Cruz and portions of the Santa Clara Valley in the south. And that includes UC Santa Cruz, much of Silicon Valley, and communities on the San Francisco Peninsula with a host of technology uh, research clusters. After distinguishing himself in public service at the local level, Senator Simidian was elected to the California State Assembly in 2000 and to the State Senate in 2004 and again in 2008. Senator Simidian currently serves as chair of the Senate Environmental Quality Committee and chair of the Senate Budget and Fiscal Review Committee number four on resources, environmental protection, energy, and transportation. We're proud to say that Mr. Simidian is a graduate of the UC Berkeley School of Law and holds a Berkeley master's degree in city planning. Senator Simidian's legislative and public policy successes are many in particular, his support for higher education and the University of California in particular is legendary. In fact, he was instrumental in securing the state's investment in the research facility we are currently sitting in. This building, Sutarja Dai Hall, is the home to Citrus, as we heard this morning, the, the California Institute for Technology Research in the Interest of Society. Citrus is one of four of California's institutes of science and innovation a unique partnership among the state, the university, California industry that was spearheaded by former Governor Gray Davis. The state committed to provide up to $100 million for Citrus so long as the university obtained the required private matching funds and we're pleased to note that those funds have far exceeded the required matching ratio. Senator Simidian was one of the university's supporters who recognized that multidisciplinary research and education on complex problems such as chemical policy and green chemistry require collaboration, they require physical facilities, they demand an ongoing focus on translating research findings into tangible benefits for the public. Mr. Simidian has pushed for this, uh, within the state to adopt legislation uh, to protect both occupational and environmental health. He pushed for state legislation to ban diacetyl, which produces a fatal lung disease among exposed workers, and to require manufacturers of high production volume chemicals to report the sale of those chemicals to the Department of Toxic Substances Control. Senator Simidian's crowning achievement, perhaps in chemicals policy, is SB 509, which along with Assemblymember Mike Fuhrer's AB 1879, is a key vehicle by which California is seeking to drive information into the hands of the people uh, who need it. Uh, after Mr. Simidian's remarks, I will uh, introduce Assemblymember Fuhr. So without further introduction, please join me in welcoming Senator Joe Simidian. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, you always wish when there's a gracious introduction like that that your wife was here to hear it. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it is great to be back on the campus and to be in uh, this really extraordinary facility. 
Uh, those of you who are Berkeley regulars know that uh, there are a range of facilities on this campus. Uh, I spent three years at uh, Bolt Hall uh, and then came back uh, to do a couple of years at the College of Environmental Design uh, over at Worcester Hall. And it seems to be this way on every campus I visit. You go to the College of Environmental Design and you think, really, this is the building for the College of Environmental Design. Uh, some of you who have been up and down those stairs uh, may have seen the same graffiti that I remember very fondly. Uh, as you walk up and down the stairs at Worcester, it says, Bad, Worse, Worst, Worcester. And, and, uh, so, let me just say what a delight it is to be here today uh, to have uh, this conversation with you. Let me uh, also just share with you, I, um, it, you know, it, probably if you've been following, uh, if you pick up a newspaper or watch the news at all, you know that uh, we're having a little bit of a struggle up in the Capitol. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it, it, you know, you can get a little grumpy, quite uh, candidly. It's a challenging time. And uh, I was uh, putting the finishing touches on my remarks last night and said to my wife, you know, really, can you imagine anything more painful than driving an hour and a half in bad weather to deliver a speech on green chemistry. Um, and she said, yeah, driving an hour and a half in bad weather to listen to a speech on green chemistry. <laughs> so uh, I want to thank you for the sacrifices you've made uh, to be here today. We'll spend a few minutes uh, and try and just share our perspective, at least uh, my perspective, and then we'll hear from my colleague and friend, Assemblymember Mike Fuhr. Uh, from the legislative front, which is only a piece, but nonetheless an important piece of this conversation. Uh, I want to be very clear about why I'm not here. I am not here today to tell you uh, that you ought to do the right thing, and for, uh, you know, because this is a holy crusade that you should invest your time or your energy or your money in green chemistry. I am here, however, to tell you why I think green chemistry is the future of doing business in California. And uh, I think this is an economic driver of immense importance in the 21st century. Uh, I think that uh, those of us who embrace uh, the notions of green chemistry uh, will really be building the next generation of innovation here in the state, uh, and that those who do not will frankly be left, to, left behind uh, back in the era of the cotton gin and the Model T and the 3G phone, and uh, it just, uh, it's going to be uh, sort of, uh, I think, a tipping point. It's going to be a time we look back on and say, did we get with the program or did we not? Um, many of you in this room have spent years, uh, no small significant sum of funds, uh, and uh, an awful lot of your time and your talent uh, invested in this effort. Uh, but I think in many respects we need to acknowledge that we're here today because Californians have, in my view understandably, uh, lost their confidence and lost their patience with us on this topic. Uh, the market has no end of offerings that come into our homes and our workplaces, uh, chemically formulated products that promise cleaner laundry, uh, germ-free countertops, smoother skin, tastier food. I want to be very clear, I want to take out a courageous position here, I am for all of those things, all right? I, I, that's, that's to the good. Uh, but I think we have to ask ourselves, um, with what consequence? Certainly, most families take these products in uh, to their homes. Most workplaces uh, bring these products into our workplace on a daily basis uh, with a great deal of trust. Brand names, in many cases, that we have known for years and years and years. And those products, in turn, expose us to hundreds, if not thousand, chemicals per day. These are chemicals that we now know may be accumulating in our bodies. The data suggests that these chemicals are making either us or our kids sick, whether we're talking about lead poisoning from lipstick, jewelry and toys, whether we're talking about phthalates and bisphenol A and baby bottles and rubber ducks uh, in interfering with our endocrine uh, development, and even some of the most popular soft drinks. <laughs> which are found in refrigerators everywhere. Uh, we are now told may contain carcinogens uh, that are somehow part of the secret formula about which we're not entitled to be told. So it should be no surprise, I think, that Californians are feeling betrayed in some respects, that they have lost their trust both in the companies that provide them with these products and also in the government that they rely on to protect them from unwanted or inappropriate exposure to those chemicals, that we have failed to safeguard them fully from the potential harm that 
chemical exposure can, in fact, result in. And that, and this is key to me, we fail to give them the information they need and want to make informed choices and protect themselves. Now, notwithstanding that failure and that disappointment, I do think it's important to acknowledge on the upside that Californians are doing what we do best. We are demanding better. We're demanding innovation. We are demanding products that not only work and that are the very best at what they do, but that are also the best for us in terms of environmental and public health. Now, in the state capital, where Assembly Member Fear and I do our work, this is translated into an effort to provide a policy framework for this conversation and to provide some policy direction. I think many of you know that initially, legislators were inclined to respond by proposing specific bills banning specific chemicals or the use of specific chemicals, uh, everything from uh, brominated flame retardants and furniture, phthalates and children's products. You heard the reference to diacetyl that I uh, worked on some years earlier. Uh, and, you know, never did I think most of my colleagues imagine that they'd be, you know, uh, listening to a member talk in committee or on the floor about uh, butter-flavored popcorn and the risks that that posed to people in the workplace. But in fact, these were the kinds of conversations we began to have. Over the years, however, I think many of us reached the conclusion that this was not the most productive conversation. Members of the legislature became increasingly concerned that we did not have the scientific expertise to make these judgments on a chemical by chemical basis. That, uh, frankly, it wasn't all that productive to listen to dueling scientists who came to the committee and in a two or three minute period of time were asked to share their point of view. The very next speaker up had an entirely contrary point of view and we were expected to somehow weigh that scientific evidence on a case by case, chemical by chemical basis. And eventually we concluded that this was really not the problem of just a few chemicals, that there was a fundamental systemic failure, that we had a broken system and we needed to take a systemic approach. The legislature commissioned UC Berkeley, Dr. Mike Wilson, to provide us with an evaluation of chemical policy here in California. And I, I shouldn't just brush by this. This in and of itself was a significant step. I want you to stop and think about this government said, maybe we'd do a better job if we were well informed and our decisions were based on good science. <laughs> Th that is no small moment and it ought to be acknowledged. That being said, Dr. Wilson's report was published in 2006. Coincidentally, just the year before, I had become the chair of the Senate Environmental Quality Committee and I thought, well, now we have the basis for a more informed and intelligent discussion in the Capitol. Let's have a public hearing. Let's raise these issues and see where the conversation takes us. Now, as I suspect virtually everybody in this room knows, that report quite concisely and quite pointedly shone the light on an inherent failing in our current system by detailing the three gaps, the three gaps that we all come to talk about now, the data gap, the safety gap, and the technology gap. And as the chair of the Senate Environmental Quality Committee, I then had the opportunity to take that work and try and move it forward into the policy arena. That's 2006. In 2007, a very good thing indeed happens, which is that a gentleman by the name of Assembly Member Mike Fuhrer has been elected to the State Assembly, is a freshman member during his 2007 and 8 term, and tackles this issue with great talent, great ability, uh, and great sense of purpose. And that means that I've got an ally and a partner and a colleague in the other house of the legislature with whom I can work on these issues. It is not simply an issue being raised by one member in one of our two houses. It is now a conversation taking place uh, in both houses of the legislature. In 2008, Assemblymember Fuhrer and I then worked together to craft legislation that addressed the need for green chemistry in California. I ended up as the author of Senate Bill 509, Assemblymember Fuhrer, as you heard, is the author of Assembly Bill 1879. And taken together, these two measures were designed to develop a toxic information clearinghouse, which would collect and make publicly available known hazard data on chemicals that were widely in use, and then create a system by which the chemicals and the products that, they con that contain them were 
evaluated, and hopefully improved for sale. When Dr. Wilson published his report in 2006, and when Assemblymember Fuhrer and I stood with Governor Schwarzenegger in Los Angeles in 2008 for the signing of our two bills, I think we probably all felt a great sense of accomplishment. We felt like we had done our part to solve the problem. Dr. Wilson's report, as I said, very succinctly outlined the gaps to be filled, and the two measures that I've described to you went about laying out a course for filling those gaps. But I think it's important to acknowledge today, and I'm guessing, I rarely feel like I can speak for my colleague, but uh, I'm guessing that I can speak for Assemblymember Fuhrer and Dr. Wilson when I say that the publication of the report and the signing of the legislation were really the first steps rather than the last steps in this process, and that the really hard work began on the day those bills were signed, notwithstanding all the hard work that we felt we had put into the effort up until that point. So here we are today, well into the year 2011, and let's just say it out loud. California still hasn't fixed any of the public policy gaps that were identified in Dr. Wilson's report back in 2006. For all the rhetoric, not to mention the hard work that went into passing the legislation, we have made what I could only describe as modest progress in Sacramento. So here's my message today. It's time to finish what we started. It's time to get the regulations completed and get on with building the green chemistry model that will serve us in the 21st century. Now, if I seem a little frustrated or impatient, it's because I am. I think it is important to note that there is some very good news, very good work that's being done. The marketplace, to its credit, has not waited for those of us in government to take action. There are business leaders who have listened to the public, who have glimpsed into the future, and who have embraced green chemistry. And they are redefining the landscape, and they're meeting a demand that we all know is there. These are the companies up and down the state that are already integrating green chemistry into their business models, and they are succeeding. They are proving that it can be done and with good results. They are growing new businesses. They are creating new jobs. And they are growing the California economy at a time when we desperately need that help. Simply put, they are proving that green chemistry works in a commercial setting. Now, some examples. Some of you will recall a few years ago, concerns were raised over the health impacts of bisphenol A. This is a debate I have heard over and over and over again in the Capitol. But there was a Chico-based water bottle company, Clean Canteen. They were poised with their alternative to plastic water bottles, stainless steel bottles. And from 2007 to 2008, their business grew by 1,000%, and their company grew from 6 to 36 employees. Slightly larger scale, the folks at Pfizer, one of the nation's largest pharmaceutical companies, employing a thousand scientists down in La Jolla, used green chemistry principles to streamline and reduce the toxicity of their manufacturing process for the antidepressant Zoloft. That new process reduced solvent use by 90% and thereby reduced hazardous waste output by hundreds of tons. Newer companies like Redwood City's Codexis, springing up to help pharmaceutical companies integrate green chemistry principles in drug development, increasing their efficiency while decreasing their environmental impact. You look Packard and Apple, and if it seems like I'm finding some companies that happen to be in my district, it's because I am. <laughs> These are computer companies that are affecting the entire supply chain of computer manufacturing by requiring suppliers to eliminate ingredients of concern, things like brominated flame retardants, and while they're doing it, they're also making their products competitive in a global marketplace. San Francisco-based clean product manufacturer Method launched its non-toxic biodegradable cleaning product line back in 2000. By the year 2007, Method was ranked the seventh fastest growing private company in America by Inc. Magazine, succeeding with green chemistry. Not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it is responding to real marketplace demand and producing real profits for companies like Method and the others I've mentioned. 
These are among the many companies that have proven that not only can green chemistry work with obvious environmental and public health benefits, but it can save money, make a company more efficient, and it can generate new business. That being said, I think we need to be candid with ourselves that we cannot expect businesses to go it alone, that government has to play a role. Old ways die hard. There are companies that are invested both financially and in terms of their corporate cultures in business as usual. Some will be reluctant converts, but will get there over time. Others, quite frankly, will have to be dragged kicking and screaming into the 21st century. The path will be different, I think, for each company. But as long as we maintain the existing legal and regulatory framework, a framework that, in my view, facilitates and, in fact, incentivizes the status quo, then we can't be surprised that a lot of companies talk the talk but don't walk the walk. They will continue to talk a good game in terms of green chemistry, but the products that they put on the shelves will not reflect a real and meaningful commitment to the 21st century green chemistry values that we're here to discuss today. The laws of this state need to reflect our understanding of and direct behavior based on the emerging green chemistry technology which you all are inventing, the very people here in the room today. Public policy needs to make sure that we level the playing field so that there's no disadvantage to being a good actor. It also needs to make sure that people have incentives to integrate green chemistry practices and principles into their daily work. We need to reward that behavior. We need to incentivize it. And we need to do that with the understanding that we are not alone in government, but that we have to partner with folks in the private sector, as well as folks in the university community who have played, and I hope will continue to play, a very real role. Let me give you an example from a different sector of the green economy. Back in 2006, I authored legislation which requires California to get 20% of its energy from renewable resources. Believe it or not, this year, we're going to hit that target. I currently have in the state legislature legislation that takes the next step to take us to 33% by 2020. What we've seen repeatedly is that when we send a clear message to the marketplace, the market responds. If we do not send that message to the marketplace, we cannot be surprised that there is no response from the market. Now, by mandating a standard in law, we can, as I say, create that level playing field, give people clear direction, provide the incentive, set a clear target that all of us can reach for. I think that is the proper role of government, and I think green chemistry is the perfect place for us to exercise that role and responsibility. Which means to get back to the conversation about regulation and the regulatory process here in California, five years after the report, two and a half years after the legislation, we need to complete the regulations. We need to implement a set of policies that encourage innovation and that influence the investment decisions that are made in the multi-billion dollar chemical industry every year here in California. We also need, in case you wonder if anybody's paying attention, we also need to support the groundbreaking work that's being done at California's universities. We are kidding ourselves if we think that we can grow our economy by disinvesting in higher education. There isn't a state or a nation in the world that has grown its economy by disinvesting, <laughs> by disinvesting in higher education. And the Center for Green Chemistry here at UC Berkeley continues to support the legislature's work in green chemistry by providing us with access to the most current state-of-the-art science in the field. I think most of you know as well that the center has developed and is implementing in the classroom the green chemistry curriculum that will educate tomorrow's workforce. Meanwhile, Dr. Woodruff and UC San Francisco's biomonitoring report released just this past year identified more than 40 prevalent toxic chemicals in the California pregnant women they tested. That work provides the evidence and identifies the need for continued push in the world of green chemistry. California's universities are national models in education, research, technology development, and the continued commitment in the green chemistry can drive not only what happens here in California, but around the country and around the globe. 
So here's my conclusion. California businesses need to lead, follow, or get out of the way. I know that's not a terribly gracious observation, but I think it's time to put our cards on the table that I mentioned five years after the report was out, two and a half years after the legislation has been passed and signed into law by the governor. Californians do not have patience for much more talk. They expect, and I think appropriately expect, for us to take action. I share my constituents' impatience and frustration, particularly with those who stood at the governor's press conference at that bill signing in Los Angeles in 2008, applauded when the bills were signed, but who have since, frankly, been obstructionists to the development of meaningful regulations that would implement the legislation who have since opposed legislation that simply requires full disclosure of the ingredients of the products that consumers pick up off the shelf or are obliged to work with in their workplace on a daily basis, who quite recently, by the way, opposed close to a dozen different groups, a simple bill that I introduced simply aimed at clarifying the authority of the Green Ribbon Science Panel. When an industry organization calling itself the Natural Products Association spoke in opposition to the Toxics Information Clearinghouse, calling it Prop 65 on steroids, I think they may have revealed more than they intended. So let me respectfully suggest that folks who don't want to get with the program step aside, that they let the innovators in California business and industry take the lead, for companies like Method, Kaiser, HP, Apple, Pfizer, and all the others that are embracing and employing green chemistry, I say keep up the good work because it's that work that's going to help California build a robust and sound green chemistry economy over the course of the coming years. We've been given our assignments. Fix the failings of the current system. And I'm hopeful that we can get the green chemistry regulations done this year we can move forward with the constructions of a toxic information's clearinghouse and the implementation of the Green Chemistry Initiative. We need to get our work done to send that signal that I mentioned to the marketplace, to send the signal that California is serious about green chemistry. If we do that, I am quite confident the market will respond. And the investment dollars and the tax revenues and the green jobs will come to California. If we do not send that signal, then those investment dollars, those tax revenues, and those jobs will go to some other state or some other nation. The choice is ours, and I hope we choose wisely. Thank you very, very much. We're running a little bit over time. We're running a little over time, and so um, we have another just a couple minutes to answer a couple questions from the floor. I'll let you uh, take those, Senator. All right. I'm going to actually let you take them. One of the things I've learned in public office is to let somebody else leave somebody out when the time comes. So you go to it. Go ahead back here. So I'm here. Uh, I agree with everything you said. Why do we hear the rhetoric about <clears throat> California being unfriendly to business? How do we square these two pictures and how do we move forward? I think the, the larger question of business climate for California is probably a day-long conference for another, uh, another occasion. I, I do think it is fair for businesses to say, we need to look at the entire business climate in California if we're going to locate here in California. But as I said in my remarks, I think whatever our views about environmental regulation may be, about how business friendly California may be, about what our tax policy may be, the starting point is to send a clear message that California not only wants to be, but is in fact open for business in the green chemistry arena. We send that clear message. This state becomes the hub of this exciting research and development. The dollars will come, and these other impediments will pale relatively once we've sent that clear message to the marketplace. Let's take one more question. Uh, Mr. Fuhrer needs to move on to 
Oakland Airport. So I want to get him up on the podium as quickly as possible. So very ble uh, briefly, please. Thank you. Uh, first, a uh, fantastic talk. I think you brought up a number of really important points. As a founder of a, a co company doing green chemistry, not in your jurisdiction, but in San Francisco. Um, I always like to say not in my district, district? yet. Yeah. <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more with what you had to say, except for that part. <laughs> uh, um, what I'd like to say is, uh, and in fact, we manufacture a product for method. We manufacture a biomedic antimicrobial system for consumers. It's the first green one. And there are really no processes. We run into all sorts of regular, the regulatory apparatus is in fact works against small innovative companies who don't have millions of dollars of budget to engage with all sorts of consultants and lobbyists to actually get through. What I'd like to ask is, is there some mechanism that you can either propose or that we can work with you from industry? Because innovation occurs within small, innovative, imaginative companies that are willing to take risks. But those barriers are very real. They're palpable. I work against them every single day. And we are, we are willing to work with government, with anyone to help try to turn that around. I believe Okay, I, I, we got, thank you. And the answer, cut you and, off. Go and, ahead. Right. And the answer to that question is, um, I'd be happy to work with you as well as the committee staff. So please be sure you get my card, the card from Rachel Maki Wagner, who's here today. I want to tie the answer in with the earlier question and with the remarks I made about uh, renewable energy. I think it is entirely fair and, in fact, necessary for people to say, you can't talk a good game about renewable energy, but then get in our way when it comes time to site those renewable energy facilities here in California. You can't talk a good game about green chemistry, but then ask us to jump through a series of hoops, even as you tell us that you are supporters of this emerging technology. To the extent we can remove those barriers, remove those obstacles, take down those hoops in an effort to encourage the technology to move farther and faster, that is our obligation. It's a reasonable expectation, and I hope you will come and ask us to live up to that commitment. Thank you again. You're going to enjoy my colleague, Mike Fuhrer.